Well, hello, this is Jeff Gadiosi, and you're on MisplacedStraws.com, where music comes to life. My guest today, he's been here a time or two, so there really isn't much left I could use for his introduction. So we'll just say he's really one of the reasons why I do this. He's been my favorite vocalist forever. But more than that, he's a great guy, he's a friend, and he's about to release a new solo record called Complicated on May 6th. Please welcome the one and only Jeff Scott Soto. Welcome back, Jeff. Thank you, brother. Well, today it's Jeff Six Soto. <laughs> I'm a little funk from uh, my little weekend worry gigs with Jason Beeler, but I'm fine. I think it's a bit of a cold, a little head cold. I'm just a little bit congested, and uh, I'll get through it. At least I don't have to work. This this is not work. Talking to you is just pleasure. It's just us talking music, talking shop, and uh, and the two Jeffs going at it. In fact, mm-hmm. I might actually because I'm such a regular on your show. I might actually just move in. You set there up you another. Go. I got I got room we'll down here. Side by side, I'll help <laughs> you interview all the other ones that that you don't want to do yourself, and we'll just make it a regular thing. Why not? I, I like it. My co-host. <laughs> <laughs> so, after Wide Awake in My Dreamland, your last record, um, the Spectra record, and the August Zadra record, Complicated's now the fourth time you've put something out with Alessandro Del Vecchio. Correct. And you, you've collaborated with a lot of people in your career, but why does this collaboration with Alessandro just seem to work so well across so many projects? I think the main reason, and it's, it's funny, I'll, I'll tap into a little of, of, of the heat that Alessandro seems to be getting. He gets a lot of heat from, from fans basically saying he's, he's overdoing it. He's, he's working with too many artists and this, this, all the artists are starting to sound the same or sound, starting to sound like things that he would be doing and working on for his own. I think that's absolutely untrue. And especially when he works with me, he puts a concerted effort into making sure that he's tapping into the, the music and the body of work that I've already done, the stuff that he really enjoys about my career. And so he's not writing with the idea of, well, this song could work for Journey, Survivor, Chicago, and Jeff Scott Soto. Everything he writes is always, for me, it's always based on what would work for me. And if you can take it to somebody else, yeah, it might be different. It might work, but it's not going to have the same personality that that it has when, when he writes it specifically for me. And that's the difference in, in working with other people that I've worked with in the past. I've worked with a lot of people that in, in terms of their involvement, again, sounds like it could work with a for a multitude of people. Mm-hmm. And I find the stuff I do with Alessandro personally sounds like it, it can only work for me. Yeah. And I had the opportunity to talk to him a couple months back when the Edge of Forever record came out. Right. And that was one of the things that we really talked about was his process. And he said how, you know, he studies the singer he's working with and he writes to the singer as opposed to just having this catalog of songs for everybody. Right. I think that goes right along with what you're saying. And, and that's the same thing, even writing the stuff with August for August Zadra or writing the stuff for Spectra. When we're writing together, we I, I do the same thing. I know BJ. I've been trying to get BJ, who is the singer of Spectra, uh, heard and, and known around the world for the longest time. He just hasn't had the right vehicles for labels to jump on. You know, every time I take one of his projects to Frontiers, I go, great voice, but it's not what we want. It's not what we're looking for. And then I had to find what they were looking for in terms of what they would say yes to in, in BJ's voice. So once again, when I was writing song, the first two songs I wrote for Spectra with Alessandro, they were they were not spe- specified for me. They were specified for BJ's voice, voice, his tone and his range. There's a lot of stuff on there I wouldn't do because it's a lot higher than I would mm-hmm. want to sing these days. So, But I'm not going to shy away from it in terms of making sure it fits his thing because if I make it more catered to what I would do, then it's going to sound more like he's trying to cover a JSS original song. And we didn't want that either. So yeah, we, we have the same kind of process when I'm writing lyrics and melodies, I think for the artists and Alessandro thinks the same when he's writing music and, and the production that's going behind every, everything that he's setting forth. Yeah, and you know, when we talk each time, I, I, we try to do something a little bit different that you don't get in a normal interview. And, and with this one, I really kind of want to get into the creative process that sure. the two of you have. And using your current single, Love is the Revolution, because I think that is really different from anything else you've done. Um, The song starts with what I assume is Alessandro playing a sitar. So step one is, does he come to you and say, hey, Jeff, I got this crazy idea to put a sitar on your record? 
or does he just send like the plain bed of music and you do your lyrics and melody and the rest of that's added later? He's pretty much uh, he's pretty much a 90 percent always all, everything's already there kind of person when he writes. If he hears a sitar uh, that that might go in later or, or something to that effect, it's going to go on there on the demo before before I even start working on it. And that's one of the things that really got me excited about that song. When I heard the demo version of it, it had that sitar on it. And immediately it took me to like, there's so many Beatles songs and Aerosmith songs that kind of have that vibe to them. I've always wanted to have that kind of thing. And without him even knowing that I've always wanted something like that, he gave it to me and I was so excited. I said, this song is not only going to be special, but this has to be a single. Yeah. I love that song so much because of the intro. And the intro pretty much set the precedence, set the kind of course of where I was going with the song. You know, again, we're talking about the Beatles. Mm -hmm. uh, they used sitar and a lot of stuff when they started getting more into the experimental uh, years of their recordings. And what's the one thing they always talked about the latter years was love and peace and harmony. Mm -hmm. So I kind of took the same idea of love is the revolution because of the sitar and what the sitar represents in peace and harmony. I kind of went with that theme in terms of everything that's going on in the world currently from Ukraine to the division, politically, religious, um, um, social injustice, all those different things. I wanted the all you need is love message for this particular song. And that to me was the next step further of love is the revolution that will get us through everything in the end. And, and it's funny because that's just where I was going to go with it is the first thing you think of when you hear is sitar anywhere is George Harrison and the Beatles. And, and then right. just the whole vibe, as you said, with love is the, rev is the revolution, but it sounds nothing like a Beatles song. Right. But, you exactly. know, like when you're listening to it, you're thinking Beatles, but it doesn't. So, you know, it, it's almost like dude, how much sort of massaging of the song did it take to get that vibe without sounding anything like the Beatles? Right. Well, it's the idea behind it. Again, they took an instrument that you wouldn't commonly use in pop music or rock music, and they utilized it with a message of peace and love and harmony behind it. If they use it in a in a, in a darker way for a song like Helter Skelter or something that was a little a little deeper and darker in the message, that might have given that instrument in the future that same kind of idea behind it. If you use that instrument, don't try to use it in something peace, love, and harmony. It'd probably be better suited in something that's talking a little darker. So because of that, that's where the influence in itself came from. You hear that and you automatically think, oh, I feel like I'm, I'm in a zen kind of mood. It's, it's putting it in that kind of peaceful, loving feeling. And so I wanted to make sure that the message behind the song matched what you hear when you hear that little piece of music starting off the song. And your band is literally all over the world. I mean, you're in LA, you know, Edu is down in South America, Alessandro and Fabrizio, I'm assuming are in Italy. So after the two of you kind of get the bones of the song, what's the route around the world that it takes? You know, where does it go next? Well, because I'm not the producer per se on, on the, the last few records, I'm not responsible for how the hows, where's and when's as much as, as Alessandro is. So I am responsible for making sure he is using my drum, my longtime drummer, Edu, because Edu basically has to play on everything of mine. Otherwise, it's not going to be released. It's, that's just the way it is. He's amazing. You're not, you're not going to sell me on another, another drummer for my, my solo releases or the other things that I, I feel Edu is the strongest representation as a drummer for but as far as the guitar is concerned i totally entrusted alessandro when he found uh fabrizio for the wide awake album and i was so impressed with his guitar work i had to bring him onto this new album he's he's kind of set a new course and standard for my solo records mm -hmm. and i was so happy that he wanted to do yet another one with us and uh whatever i had to do to make sure he was going to be part of it i made you know i, I told alessandro make sure that he's going to do it um Ale is so he's such a diverse artist in terms of his writing but also as his playing and his production he's one of those jack of all trades so I can entrust somebody like Alessandro in every sense of the words like it's like trusting somebody with your newborn mm -hmm. you know when you leave your newborn with with grandma or 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 somebody in the family that knows how to nurture a baby that's exactly what you're going to get in the end and that's what I do with Alessandro my music and like I said, the, the vibe of this song is something that we really haven't heard you do with your solo stuff before. 
so does that go to your comfort level and trust with Alessandro that if he comes to you with something new that, you know, has never been on a JSS record before, you're willing to give it a try, you know, and not say, well, hang on, I've never done that. You know, I don't know how it's going to work because, you know, he's right. creating it for you. Exactly. And this is one of the reasons why I have to trust them the way I do, <laughs> because I don't personally write anymore in terms of music is concerned. I don't sit here with a guitar and a keyboard and come up and craft out a song. My my skills are kind of limited as a musician, as a, as a guitar player or a keyboard player. I would rather write a song with somebody who excels on their instrument to the point that they're going to come up with ideas I could never come up with because I can't play them. Mm -hmm. I can hum ideas, <laughs> but if I can't play them, I'm not going to think about them when it comes to vocals and melodies and lyrics. That's my forte. That's where I step up. So you give me a piece of music, a, a kind of blank canvas or a sketched canvas, I'm going to fill in the colors. And that to me is the best way of creating. That's why I entrust Alessandro. He'll send me two or three songs at a time. And 98% of the time of you're hearing exactly what I heard on the demo versions. Mm -hmm. You're not getting, uh, you're not getting, well, this is kind of an idea. And then later we're going to start filling in the blanks. And I love that he's a visualist the same way I am when I'm creating. I want to make sure you hear and see the whole picture without having to try to imagine it later. And I think that really does fit in with all the stuff you have going on. I mean, you know, with JSS solo stuff with Alessandro, you know, the Sons of Apollo stuff with all of those guys, and even the right. Soto band stuff, you know, with Tony Dickinson and that crew. Right. Does it keep it fresh for you because you're getting just these different ideas that are so diverse from each other, you know, you're doing something completely different every time. This is one of the reasons a lot of people think uh, Mike Portnoy, when he left Dream Theater, he jumped into four or five different projects at a time simultaneously because because he's trying to make a living or trying to find a new niche. Mike was basically fulfilling something he couldn't do with just one band. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of my mentality with everything. I, I know I can't do with Sons of Apollo that I, I what I would do with uh, like a JSS kind of sound, or I can't do with Talisman what I could do with mm -hmm. Soto. There's so many different things that I wanted to happen to musically that won't work with one particular band. I think there's only one band that was able to pull that off and trying every avenue and trying and going to every lane and that was queen yeah me being a student of queen and me being so, that that dna so injected into my soul i always knew i wanted to be more than just the genre laden artist i didn't mm -hmm. want to be just a metal guy rock guy pop guy blues guy jazz guy i wanted to be all of the above it's kind of the reason i call this album complicated it's the best way to describe me as an artist it's mm -hmm. it's just complicated it's 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 impossible to describe me as an artist because i want to do all of the above. I don't want to just do A, B, C, or D. And with that being said, I, I'm able to tap into so many things that fulfill me and challenge me as an artist, my creation, and even my bucket list items that I wouldn't be able to do if I were just in one band, you know, going down one lane. And you talk, getting back to the album, another song that really stood out for me was Thank You. Um, when it comes to your solo stuff, a lot of your writing is more personal than you know, we'll see in Sons of Apollo or Soto or you know, some of the other things. But this track in particular, you, know, it, you could tell it meant a lot to you and it means a lot to the listener as well because we kind of feel that coming through. Tell me a little right. bit about that song, kind of you know, where the inspiration for that came from. When I was writing it, I... I did come up with the idea of wanting to thank a, an individual or individuals for exactly what the message of the song is, allowing me to be me, allowing me to be the best that I can be, allowing me to express myself in the ways that I have as a person. And it wasn't even as an artist, it was more as a person. And as I was going along with it, and I always write in double entendre, this is kind of my way of keeping things fresh and exciting, even for myself as an artist. I like to write things where you might think it's about one thing and it actually is about others. I think we've discussed this before. This particular song started as a kind of a thanks towards, it could be towards your parents, it could be towards a loved one, it could even be towards a friend that kind of supported you and followed you and kind of pushed you along the way and made sure that you didn't give up your dreams. And then I realized, you know what, I'm actually writing this about my fans. I'm actually thanking my fans. And the overall message started kind of shifting 
and I, I focus more on making sure the song was a personal thank you to every single person that's been there from day one and is still there today pushing and, and, and making sure that I don't walk away from this living my dream, so to speak. But then if you actually stop and read the lyrics, it can go back, to, it can revert back to exactly what I was starting the, the song as. It can have multiple meanings and reasons why I'm thanking the person or persons in that song. And I wanted to make sure that the message came across in all aspects and in, in all sides. But the bottom line is that song is my thank you to the fans. If everything ended tomorrow, that's kind of my, my swan song. That's my thanks for everything that you allowed me to do. I can walk away now and feel fulfilled. And as a fan listening to it, I, I think that comes across very strong but i think the other thing and it just goes to show when a song is well written and is a great song you feel so many different things because of it you know at sure. one point as you're feeling it you're thinking that it's you thanking your fans or in the people around you but i think from a fan perspective as i'm listening it's also you run through your own mind the people in your own life that means something right. to you, you know? So it's almost like, you know, you're expressing what we're feeling toward the people in our lives. And I think that's the mark right. of a great song. Well, thank you. And yeah. and to be honest with you as well, I, I, I just realized as well that there's an extended uh, entendre behind the song as well. It's, this is my 20 year anniversary working with Frontiers Records. Mm -hmm. So in, in a lot of ways, that's even a thank you to them for, for believing in me and for, for staying the course with me. It, again, I'm, I'm reflecting on the lyrics now, and it, it very much can be a, a kind of uh, a, a, a gratification towards them for, you know, for not giving up on me. There are so many times I'll go to them and say, hey, I want to do a, a funk album or a soul album. And I'm like, oh, boy, this is not what we invested in. This is this is not going to sell. Your fans don't want this. But they allowed me to be me because they wanted me to be happy. They wanted if I want to try something, let me try it. You never know, but there might be a fluke. It actually happens in a big way, but in most senses and in most general terms, they kind of know what my audience wants and they made sure that I stayed on course with that, especially nowadays. I, I just try to stay the course of what people expect of me. And, you know, of course I want to give it a little extra. I don't want to repeat myself or just keep making the same record. But on the other hand, I do have a responsibility to the label and the responsibility to the people that buy the music. So I, I kind of keep all those ideals when I'm working on these records and making sure that they all kind of fit in the same bookcase. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you don't want to, again, I could, I could become the art, the kind of artist like Queen that every album is so different. Every other song is different from one another. But at this point in my life where I have nothing to, uh, nothing to prove, I, I really just kind of want to write it out and, uh, and just continue on the laurels that I already you know, laid behind me. Well, and, and that kind of brings right up. It's almost like you're reading my notes here. Because <laughs> where I was going to go now is recently, you know, over the past couple of years, you have looked back on your career a, a bit more than you have previously with the revisions record and the duets collection. And is that kind of something that will continue? You know, we talked last time about the duets collection being a volume one. Um, right. But what did you kind of learn about your catalog and your songs when you were going through assembling those two records, Revisions and the Duets Collection? Well, the thing about especially doing an album like Duets, it, it, it just, it really took me back. It took me back to the, especially the older songs, took me back to those times. Of course, everything's changed. My voice has changed, the way I sing, my approach. So, and that's normal, that's life. You know, you progress in life, you move on, you find new avenues, new ways of dealing with things. You learn from mistakes, you learn from uh, regrets. But in revisiting some of these songs, like I said, especially the older ones, like Don't Let It End or Calling All Girls, it took me back to a time where I was writing for that time, and but yet it still feels as strong. It still kind of holds up today. And this is one of the reasons why I didn't stray too far away from redoing what I originally did when I I let the singers kind of give their their interpretations of how they would do them but I tried to kind of stick to the script because nobody wants to hear you completely reinventing something that they're so close to and I'm just as close to a lot of this material mm -hmm. so I made sure that I I was respecting not only the material and and the ways I did those things but I was respecting the fans and their feelings about those original versions of the songs because I don't the last thing I want to do is 
try to force anything on somebody that, well, here's the way I meant it to sound. And I'm like, I don't like this. I like what you did because this is, it was a point in time in my life when I listened to this, that's why it worked. And that's why it still works for me today. You try to change that inter interpretation. You're, you're, you're basically forcing somebody to say, to forget about what, what you did originally to, Oh, just remember this version. And they're not going to do that. And I'll give you another point in case. I'm, I'm sorry to harp on this, but there was a few years ago we were talking about re-releasing the first two Talisman albums mm -hmm. with our drummer, Jamie Borger, the drummer that's still with us when we still play out today. He was the mainstay drummer the, during the course of the band. But those early albums were done on drum machines. They were on program mm -hmm. drums. And when you listen to them, yes, it sounds dated. It sounds, you, you can hear that they're not real drums. It's not a real drummer playing them. So we thought, why don't we give the songs their due and and actually re-record all the drums, remix them, leave all the other parts the same, not redo anything else except releasing them with real drums. Everybody was on board. We thought, what a great idea. I mentioned it in one interview. And first the, the journalist and the, the, the reviewer said, that's the worst idea you can actually do. Those songs hold such a place in my heart. The way they sound, the way they yeah. are, I don't get crap if it's not real drums if it's not mixed the right way the way it is is so embedded in my memory from 30 years ago now you're going to alter the course of history by redoing something because you think it's going to make it better it's going to make it worse because as a fan i'm so connected to it the way it is and i never thought of it that way it wasn't until that that uh interview came out and we got slammed not slammed in a negative way but we got slammed with the same kind of uh, the point counterpoint people were coming back and saying yes great idea the original lineup are all together and the original versions of the songs counterpoint bad idea because you're changing the course of history and this is it's a long-winded reply to what you're asking but this is another reason why i had to do it the way i did it on yeah. the duets thing and if i do more in the future i would keep that same ideal yeah because i mean you're changing our memory you know and that's regardless of what the original sounded like that's what got us where we are and that's what's in our head so i get that completely right and you know, you're as you mentioned you're doing some shows with beeler um and he got you sick so we'll blame him for that um <laughs> the guy's yeah. bulletproof every time i get sick i got covid in february and i was with him every single day him and his family every day they none of them got it i was the only one that got it you gotta be kidding me yeah, it's so Sons it's of Apollo. Fun. You guys finally will have your South American run coming up at some point this year. What's it been like getting back on the road after the layoff? Well, to be honest with you, it, we're still dealing with the, uh, the 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 proper the parameters, the mandates, the protocols, all the things that we have to do to stay safe, to keep each other safe. We have a responsibility for all of us, every one of us, including the ones that come see us and the people that work for us and work with us. So we're still navigating how to pull it off. It was it was challenging pulling off the uh, the the tal I'm sorry the TSO tour, mm -hmm. and we it will be challenge it will be just as challenging as it was for us to get used to wearing masks and locking down and doing all the things that we got so accustomed to during the the whole COVID outbreak and pandemic. It's the same going back to real life. We are navigating how to get back to it because it's not how we remembered it. It's not going to be how we remembered it. We have to find new ways and courses to make sure that every single thing we do is not going to end in disaster and, and pulling the plug and having to go home. Hmm. Hopefully. And you, know, you mentioned TSO and band just celebrated its 25th anniversary. You've been with them right. for over a decade now. 15 years now. It, you have any thoughts or does it even cross your mind at all about that band and Paul O'Neill specifically, you know, making it someday into the rock and roll hall of fame now that they're 25 years in, I mean, there has never been a band that has done what Paul and TSO has done, whether it's touring or selling records. I mean, you know, has, is somebody who's there, but wasn't there at the beginning, you have, ever have any thoughts on just the legacy of that band? Not necessarily, because obviously the legacy of that band truly lies on the lap of, of Paul O'Neill and God rest his soul, not having any longer, it really is an injustice 
to everything that he lived for and, and worked for that he's not still here to be able to enjoy the not the necessarily the fruits and the benefits the rewards but just looking at what this actually means to people in the end one of the reasons why we could not go dark during the pandemic in 2020 um there's no way we could have done a tour we, we couldn't have even done one show we had to do the, the live stream because the one thing that paul and his stories and his words and trans Siberian orchestra convey is hope and more than ever especially at the end of 2020, we needed hope. We needed to know there was something to look forward to in the future. And by us rallying and the extremities that we had to go through from COVID officers and testing every day and, and just our, the, the airtight bubble that we were in, we had to make sure we delivered that message of hope that year, in, as well as every other year that we've been doing this. Because more than ever, the TSO message was very important. In, in the year 2020. Mm. The fact that we were able to pull it off in 21, the same thing. We all had to rally together and make sure we were all as responsible as the last person because one person screws up, one person gets uh, selfish or greedy or mm. says, I'm not gonna sit in my room on a day off. I'm gonna go out and have a beer. I'm gonna go out to a restaurant. And that basically spoils the whole soup. Yeah. Everybody has to go home. And it's not fair. So we all went in with the same mentality, whether you believe in COVID, whether you believe in the vaccine, any of that, all of that was out the window. We were one united family to make sure we could pull this tour off without screwing up the, the whole idea of why we're doing the tour. And that is our, that's our tribute. That's our paying respect to Paul O'Neill. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and those kind of accolades are wonderful, be lovely to be acknowledged in that way. But as far as I'm concerned, knowing that I, we always joke that uh, TSO is the biggest underground band on the planet because what other band can outsell every other major tour, a lot of major tours in the two months that we go out annually compared to other bands that are going out for seven, eight, nine, even 10 months in the year. And we're grossing as much as they are because we have an underground uh, following of people that that message is that important too. And it continues to grow and it continues to spread. And that's what I love about TSO, the, the message that comes behind that on top of the music and the visuals and all the other things that are the, hmm. the, uh, the live portions yeah. of what you're getting out of it. When you pull all of that aside, that message of hope will always be there. And that's, it, it's just a great thing to have and be a part of. It is, it is. We've been spending some time here with the great Jeff Scott Soto. The record is called Complicated. It's out everywhere May 6th. And, you know, as busy as you are, do you already have the next project lined up for Once Complicated's out to the world? I think I have the next five lined up. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely insane how busy I am and I always am. But it's strange because I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to distract my life by staying as busy as I possibly can. For the most part, it's hard for me to say no to things I really want to do. So instead of saying no, I find I just say yes and I find ways of pulling them off. Mm -hmm. This the thing I'm doing with Beeler. It's a great thing that we're building, and it's something that neither of us expected to to be as, as accepted as it's been. So we continue doing it because we absolutely love it. It's a, a completely different animal from what we're used to, and we're getting so accustomed to making it a part a regular part of our lives. The, the same way TSO has been a regular part of my life. This whole Beeler thing that we're doing is, is becoming yet another kind of little neat little chapter that I'm, I'm able to I'm able to extend in, into my arsenal now. Well, Jeff, as always, it's always a pleasure talking to you. And I'm sure as those next five projects come up, we will be talking five more times. So <laughs> I appreciate that. And I told you earlier before we started talking, I misplaced the straws that I used for my uh, my iced coffees. And I thought of you and hit, lo and behold, there you were. You were on my list of, uh, of interviews today. So I was thinking about you yesterday, looking for my straws. And I'm talking about you, uh, talking with you about it today. <laughs> Always, my friend. Feel better. Best of luck. And we will catch you on the road soon. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for letting me chew your off. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> Thank you. All, right. All the best. All right. Bye-bye.